Hello, I'm Dr. Keenan Puritan. Welcome to Lost Episodes in American History. In today's segment, we're going to focus on the branch of government that most impacts our lives. Which branch is it? I'll give you a hint. It's not the executive branch and the President of the United States. Presidents come and go every four years. And it's not the congressmen and senators who meet to pass laws in the building behind me. They come and go every two to six years. You guessed it. It's the nine men and women who wear the black robes and work in that building across the street, the Supreme Court of the United States. Once a Supreme Court justice or appellate court judge puts on his or her black robe, they typically wear it for life. That's right. We think budgets and health care laws and bailouts are big deals, and they are, but those can change with the next Congress. The decisions that have the most impact on our nation over decades are the ones made by the high courts of the land. They decide what is constitutional and what isn't. In today's segment of Lost Episodes in American History, we're taking a look at the Supreme Court and whether or not they've lost the original intent of the Founding Fathers. What impact does that have on the founding principles like religious liberty? The key historical figure in this story is one of the biggest names in America's history, Thomas Jefferson. Behind me is the Supreme Court building. The decisions handed down by the nine black robe justices of that court have a dramatic impact on our society, particularly when it comes to the place of religion in public life, God in government, and Christianity in American culture. The day the Supreme Court made a U-turn is the subject of this lost episode. The day the court made this U-turn was February 10th, 1947. That's when the Supreme Court ruled in Everson versus Board of Education that New Jersey could help subsidize busing for families who send their children to Catholic parochial schools. Now, while few would argue with the ruling in the specific case, the ramifications of its wording had a much wider and more devastating impact. Justice Hugo Black wrote for the court's majority. Here's what he said, quote, the establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment means at least this, neither a state nor the federal government can openly or secretly participate in the affairs of any religious organizations or groups, and vice versa. In the words of Jefferson, this should seem familiar, the clause against the establishment of religion by law was intended to erect, quote, a wall of separation between church and state. He concluded, the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach. According to the court, there could be no influence one way or the other by the church on the state or the state on the church. But is that what the people responsible for giving us the First Amendment intended? That there should be a high, impregnable wall separating church from state, God from government, Christ from culture? Let's go back and retrace their steps and discover their original intent from their very words in the debates and proceedings of Congress. This book is the debates and proceedings of Congress. Gales and Seton's official record from 17, 89, when the Congress came up with the First Amendment, okay? That's the book right here. The first federal Congress met in 1789 in New York City. James Madison, one of the principal architects of the Constitution, brought up the need to amend the Constitution by adding a Bill of Rights. In fact, Madison proposed a whole set of amendments on June 8, 1789. And the one on religious liberty stated this, quote, the civil rights of none shall be abridged on account of religious belief or worship, nor shall any national religion be established, nor shall the full and equal rights of conscience be in any manner or in any pretext infringed. While some members of the House were reluctant to pursue these amendments with all the pressing matters of getting a government started, Madison prevailed and a committee was appointed. This committee brought its first draft of these amendments to the House on August 15, 1789. And here's how the debate unfolded on the religious question according to the official congressional record found in that book. Mr. Sylvester 
had some doubts on the propriety of, of the mode of expression used in this paragraph. He apprehended that it was liable to a construction or interpretation different from what had been made by the committee. He feared it might be thought to abolish religion altogether. Mr. Huntington said that he feared that the words might be taken in such latitude as to be extremely hurtful to the cause of religion. Mr. Madison thought if the word national was inserted before religion, it would satisfy the minds of the honorable gentleman. He believed that the people feared one sect or denomination might obtain preeminence and establish a religion to which they would compel others to conform. From this discussion and debate, three important points become evident. First, the concern about establishment was directed toward preventing a particular sect or denomination of Christianity from gaining national sanction by congressional action. That's the arguments of Madison and Carroll. Secondly, the term national proposed by Madison would have made the amendment more clear for those reading it in our day, but it had a negative connotation for some in that day because of that ongoing debate between the Federalists, strong federal government, and the Anti-Federalists, advocates of states' rights. Thirdly, others expressed the concern that this amendment's original intention would be forgotten in the future and it would be used to prohibit public religious expression. That was the arguments of Sylvester and Huntington, and their concerns proved to be prophetic. Madison's original amendment on the subject, nor shall any national religion be established, basically gets the crux of the matter. The discussion and debate that follows in both the House and the Senate put the matter beyond question. They did not want the federal government to sanction a certain denomination as the state church, like the Church of England. They rejected the notion of a federal government endorsed and tax supported church, which was exactly what many of the founders forefathers fled in coming to America. Consequently, the First Amendment's establishment clause was never intended to prohibit public expressions of religion, such as a student's right to pray or read his or her Bible in public schools, placing a plaque or a monument of the Ten Commandments in a courtroom or a public building, and on and on we can go. In fact, with the amendments approved by both houses of Congress and their session coming to a close, the chair of that House subcommittee that came up with that First Amendment on religion, Elias Boudinot, said that, quote, he could not think of letting the session pass over without offering an opportunity to all the citizens of the United States of joining with one voice in returning to Almighty God their sincere thanks for the many blessings he had poured down on them. The resolution passed, and George Washington responded by proclaiming a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed on November the 26th, and it is one of the founding actions that led to our national holiday of Thanksgiving. So, the President and the very Congress who framed and approved the First Amendment thought it was fitting to issue a public proclamation urging the citizens of America to thank God for, among other things, the Constitution and its amendments. That doesn't sound like a group who was trying to separate religion from public life. Okay, if therefore the founders never intended or even used the phrase wall of separation between church and state to exclude religious expression in public life, and if the original intention of the Establishment Clause was only to guard against the establishment of a national denomination, then that 1947 Supreme Court and all the succeeding courts have it all wrong. In reality, our courts have taken the First Amendment and turned it upside down. It now means the opposite of what it originally meant. The court that did a U-turn in the opposite direction away from this original intention is yet another lost episode in American history. Yeah.